I do want to take this opportunity today because we are now um, just about two weeks from the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. And the word in Hebrew for ceasefire is hafsakat ish. It's like a stopping of fire, a ceasefire, a stopping of fire. And it happens very often that when we are in the midst of conflagration, people feel so um, threatened and vulnerable that they don't want to talk about really the, the root causes and try to understand what's going on. And, and, and I heard often in this latest escalation and in others, like, just wait, just wait. Now's not the time. We hear this in America very often whenever there's a mass shooting and people say, like, don't use this moment to try to talk about or understand the politics of it. This is just a moment for grief. But now there's a hafsakat ish. There's a cessation of fire. And we know that there's a difference between ceasefire and peace. And the only way to get from ceasefire to peace is to have those difficult conversations that we so don't want to have most of the time. So I just want to take a few moments with you this morning and, and, and try to continue to push the bounds of that conversation a little bit, if we can, here as a community surrounded by love and in the context of love. I want to share with you something that I don't think I've ever shared publicly before, which is um, when I was a little girl of six or seven years old, I used to stand before going into the shower in the morning and say the words of Shema. I did not know the meaning of Shema. I didn't really know any Jewish prayers well, but I knew the words of Shema, not the meaning. But I knew that this was something that Jews did before going into the shower. And as many of you know, I really wasn't raised as a religious Jew, and I certainly had not yet had any Holocaust training at that young age. But somewhere in my life, I had heard or learned or picked up that Jews arriving at Auschwitz were told that the gas chambers were showers, and that many of them said Shema before walking in. Hitler's shadow loomed large, even in, in my New Jersey suburbs. And I've quoted here many times the, the teaching of one of my teachers, Rabbi Harold Schulweis, who taught that the Holocaust was the dominant psychic reality of the Jew. Even Jews like me, whose, whose family came a few years or even a generation before the Holocaust from Europe, and even Jews from North Africa and Jews from the Middle East, who were not affected by the Holocaust, but who dealt with their own trauma in the years after the establishment of the state when they themselves were expelled from or forced to flee from their own homes as well. I want to talk this morning for a few moments about what it means to hold trauma, real, profound, inherited, generational trauma at the heart of a communal identity. What does it mean to filter the world through the ever-present lens of both past and present catastrophe? One of the ways that it manifests is that when David and I came out to LA and we were looking for homes, as we walked through new houses that we were considering buying, we sort of joked about which one had better hiding places for when the Nazis would come. And I know that that might sound crazy, and I also know that we're probably not the only ones in this place who have had those conversations and who've talked like that and thought like that. It means that when two of my friends were killed in a bus bombing during the Second Intifada, I understood why it is said that when the Jews count our dead, we don't count one, two, three. We count six million one, six million two, six million three. Every threat, every loss, every tragedy falls on the still open wound of a collective trauma. But it's not a trauma that we talk a lot about and it's not a trauma that we feel comfortable exploring or speaking about publicly. But it manifests, and it's real. It means that when I was watching on CNN as the white nationalists took to the streets in Charlottesville, and I heard them say, like we all did, Jews will not replace us, I knew that it wasn't an accident, and I knew that it wasn't incidental, 
Instead, I recognized a familiar hatred, a very old and powerful tool that emerges in societies here and there and everywhere whenever those in power want to profit from fear and division. I didn't fully understand at the time how much anti-Semitism stood at the heart of white nationalism. That's taken a few more years to unpack, but I knew that this was real. And it means, this trauma, that for 73 years, our collective Jewish communal relationship with Israel has also been rooted in trauma. This is a trauma that's been exacerbated by the murderous rhetoric and actions of Hamas and Iran. And this is also a trauma that has all too often been exploited by Israeli politicians on the far right, and even by some American Jewish leaders. I'm not making excuses. I'm just trying to speak honestly about what is too often spoken about only in whispers. If it seems to some of us rather inexplicable that so many Jews in the diaspora remain silent over the years, even as an extremist Kahanist ideology moved from the margins to the mainstream in Israel, despite the fact that we're actually repulsed by the idea of Jewish supremacy, I want to invite us to think about the impact of generational trauma and what it does to a people that never fully feels safe and accepted and at home, and how that might very quickly turn into silence. If you don't understand why so few or maybe no major American Jewish organizations protested decades of settlement expansion in the West Bank, or the codification of these incredibly discriminatory and problematic anti-democratic laws targeting Palestinians over the years, even though each of those steps pushed us further and further away from fulfilling the aspirations articulated in the Declaration of the Establishment of the State and pushed us further and further away from the proud mantle of democracy that so many of us still hold so dear, I wanna invite us to think about the effects of trauma passed down one generation to the next. And if you wondered why it was that so many leaders in our community in all different kinds of roles allowed themselves to succumb to a communal script about Israel that, that focused on only three things, on the media bias against Israel, on the ubiquitous anti-Semitism there and around the world, and on the existential threats facing Israel. I want to invite you to think again about trauma. Maybe you heard what happened in Ohio this week, where there was a high school student, an observant Jew, who was a football player who missed a weight training. And as punishment, his coach forced him to sit surrounded by all of his teammates and eat an entire pepperoni pizza as an act of humiliation. And I know that for some people that might not seem like a terrible punishment, but I wanna say that for, for many Jews like me, for whom kashrut is central not only to our faith, but also to our Jewish identity, this is a profound humiliation and a gross violation. And this didn't come out of nowhere. So, so listen, our community is extremely reactive around anti-Semitism. It's true, sometimes excessively so. And yet that response is rooted in inherited intergenerational trauma. And if you wonder what's at the heart of some of those most insidious attacks, campaigns to marginalize voices, sometimes like mine and like others, voices of dissent, especially voices like those that are really trying to lift up a vision of a just and equitable society in Israel and Palestine, a shared future. Well, that too is trauma. And again, I'm not trying to excuse reckless behavior or irresponsible or cruel actions. I'm just trying to help us understand what's actually going on here, and I really do understand it. I understand it because I, like many of you, feel Jewish vulnerability in my body. I feel it for my children, with whom David and I have had to have numerous conversations over the course of the last several weeks about how Jewishly identifiable they should be from the outside. This is your rabbi talking to her children about whether or not they should be taking a kippah off when they walk right out the doors of this building. 
when they're in school during the week. I land on the side of keeping the kippah on, by the way, but it has been an active conversation. And that is part of the internal calculation that many Jews in America are having today. And while the reaction may be excessive, it is not unwarranted. So we know that our response is rooted in fear and is rooted in trauma. And I think we all know and probably would agree that a fear and trauma driven response is not a moral response. Not when it comes to Israel-Palestine and not when it comes to any of the conflicts in each of our lives or in all of our lives. And even still, it's really hard to think about how we might open up our hearts to another way when we still feel incredibly vulnerable and the vulnerability is real. So I want for us to look at one particular moment, one particular lesson from this week's Parsha, from Parsha Shlach, and see out the spies to go and look at the land, and Jonah will teach us more about this in just a few moments. The spies are asked to do a full analysis and to come back and to report back on a few very specific questions. Are the people strong or are they weak? Are they few or are they numerous? Is the land good or is it bad? Is it fertile? Is it lean? Is it flourishing? Is it barren? And how are the cities? Moses asks the spies. Are they open or are they fortified? Now, I wonder what you think the reason for that question is. Are the cities open or are they fortified? The shot of this, the simple rendering of this text is that Moshe is trying to determine how easy it will be to attack and to conquer this place. The assumption is that they're in, if they're encamped, if they're b'machanef, they're out in the open, they'll be easier to conquer. But if the cities are fortified, if they have giant walls of fortification around them, they'll be harder to conquer. The walls will protect them. But then comes Forno, one of our commentators, and he really challenges the simple understanding of encamped versus fortified cities. He says, if they live in open cities, that's actually a signal that they feel secure without the fear of war. If they live in fortified or walled cities, what that suggests is that the inhabitants are actually living in fear. The fear of being attacked and the fear of being invaded. And that actually is the source of their vulnerability. Sforno asks us to consider that the walls are not only about physical security, but they reflect a spiritual state. In other words, maybe what Moses is trying to determine is if they are fortified, that means the people are weaker because they've spent so much time setting up defenses and fortifications that they have not strengthened their hearts and their spirits so that they can actually overcome whatever is sent toward them. Consider that for a moment. The fortification actually is a reflection of weakness, not of strength. So what happens when the walls of a highly fortified city are breached? The city falls because the city rests on a false sense of invulnerability because it has no defense other than that fortification. But the unfortified city, the city that is permeable, the city that is open to ideas and influences, this is a city that can withstand even great challenges because it's not defined by fear and it is not defined by trauma. It is fluid, it's not rigid. So here's what I'm asking us to consider on this Shabbat, in midst all of the tumult and the vulnerability. When we fortify our hearts, when we become rigid in our understandings, we actually weaken ourselves. But when we speak truthfully, when we open our hearts to contemplate the perpetuation of unimaginable hardship on Palestinians over the course of many decades of policy, when we open our hearts in this moment in history right now, the last several years have invited us into a kind of deep honest self-reflection. We've heard and read and said things in this country that probably many of us could never have imagined that we would say. Our hearts have grown. New ideas have been planted. And you know what? It hasn't killed us. 
the stretching open of our hearts to see and read and understand perspectives different from the normative perspectives has not hurt us. In fact, it's made us stronger. The encampment of our hearts wide open to the elements, it doesn't always feel safe and it definitely exposes us. But unlike those who build a rigid fortification around their hearts, this exposure offers us the potential for growth. I know that this is really hard to talk about. I know this is hard to hear when the landscape of our emotional and spiritual lives is defined by trauma and by fear. Imagine camping out under the starry night sky when you've been attacked before and nearly destroyed. Even in recent memory, in our presence today, we have a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto. This is living history and living memory today. What does it mean to make yourself that vulnerable when you have suffered loss, when you know that your enemy wants to destroy you because he tells you that himself in his own charter? And even still downstairs in this building that has become a sacred home for prayer for us, there's a, wall, a sign on the wall that says strong views loosely held. Have any of you noticed that before when we prayed down there? Strong views loosely held. It's a reference to the famous Gemara in Masechet Eruvin. When there's a machloket, there's a dispute between two schools, Shammai and Hillel, and they argue for three years. And ultimately, the Baikal, the voice of God, comes down and says, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayimem. You're both right, but the law goes according to Hillel. And, and the rabbis ask, well, if they're both right, how can you choose that the law is going to go with Hillel? And you might remember that this famous Gemara says that the difference between Hillel and Shammai and the reason that Hillel merited to have the law go according to his way was nochin ba'aluvinhen, because they were compassionate and they were decent and they were humble and they allowed themselves to be vulnerable. They even said the words of their opponent before their own and not just to shoot it down, but because they knew that there must be some truth in Shammai's perspective too. Strong views, loosely held. But if you know you're right, why do you have to hold them so loosely? Because even when we're right, we're also sometimes a little bit wrong. And even when we're really right, sometimes other people are also right as well. The conversation on Israel-Palestine has shifted. It's not going back. We're not gonna somehow magically revert to two months ago where we, many of us could comfortably hold positions that felt like they were in the mainstream. The margins now are the mainstream. The conversation has changed. And it is so clear today that there is no righteousness in defending human suffering or denying what is evidently clear, no matter how much trauma we hold in our own body. That not only causes harm to other people, but it harms us too. And we absolutely have no choice but to find another way. The path before us now, the brave path, the strong path, requires that we defortify that we defortify our own hearts, that we let down our defenses, and we allow ourselves to see what we might learn, that we hold our views and our truths, but we hold them loosely, and we allow ourselves to be open to the elements, open to the reality that the miracle of the establishment of the state of Israel was also a Nakba, it was also a catastrophe, open to the fact that ignoring escalating indignities on a population under Israeli control not only is morally defensible, but it threatens the viability of the very thing that so many of us love so dearly. Open to history and to a narrative of a people that we have lived next door to for a very long time, but have done very little to try to actually understand. I've thought a lot about this over the course of the last many years and especially the last month. I really want my Jewish children to inherit our traditions and our history, but I don't want them to inherit our trauma, especially if that means closing their hearts to another people's pain. When we take down those defenses, something happens. Something happens. This is not a call for a particular political solution. This is a call for a relearning, for a kind of reckoning, a truth telling. It's a prayer that we figure out how to see and how to affirm and how to hear one another. We Jews who know what it means to be persecuted and exiled and genocided, we ought to be the first 
to know also how to empathize with another dispossessed people. Leaving the fortress now, stepping out of the walled city might make us feel incredibly vulnerable and defenseless, but it is the only way that growth and also ultimately that peace will ever come. I know that I never would have suspected that I would stand here on Shabbat celebrating a government that looks likely to step into power now in Israel, that puts some of those characters in power that are certainly not aligned with me on many of the core principles. And yet I think we can all agree that it's nothing short of a miracle that a government coalition has now been established that many would have deemed truly and utterly impossible just a couple of days ago. When we let down our fortifications, things start to happen. We start to see that the impossible might actually be possible. We start to find a deeper truth. And the truth that I hope that we find as we explore and we open and we make ourselves vulnerable is that on one small sliver of land lives two peoples, both of whom carry lifetimes of inherited and active trauma all of whom need and deserve to live in dignity and without fear. Many, many thousands of Israeli Jews and Palestinians are making that point every single day now. We would do well to make space for them in our hearts, to listen to them, to amplify them, to fund them, to platform them, to actively work with them to dismantle the systems that were built to keep these populations divided and unequal. Let those people, those brave folks on the street be our guide, whispering to all of us, observers from over the sea, the permission to stretch open our own hearts, to listen, not with the intention of confronting and disproving and defeating the other who obviously knows less than we do, but with the intention of Hillel, the intention of a teacher who is truly committed to understanding the other side as well as our own. That, I believe, is the only way forward, the way that we reorient our hearts and our communal discourse toward truth-telling and justice, toward healing, and toward a shared future for all. I wish you Shabbat Shalom.